Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Manjo. I am a current student here at Said Business School and an EdTech entrepreneur. I uh, have been living in Kenya for the last seven years. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists uh, for the Seats at the Table of Africa's Tech Ecosystem panel. We are joined by some incredible women today. First, our moderator, Lucy Mullins, is the co-founder and COO of StepLadder, which pioneers collaborative finance and revolutionizing the home buying process. And besides being an IT and fintech champion, she's an entrepreneurship expert here at Said Business School and an accredited executive coach. She is going to uh, in, introduce a conversation with our speakers. We have Lorraine Wright, a director at UBS, which is a Swiss global financial services firm Firm, as well as a director of sales for a Ghana-based agriculture crowdfunding, commodity trading, and crowd farming platform that enables anyone to farm from the comfort of their living room by sponsoring smallholder farmers. Later on, we're going to be jo joined by the Honorable Emma Inamotila Theophilus, currently a member of parliament and the deputy minister in the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology in the Republic of Namibia. She's currently held up in a cabinet meeting, but she will hopefully be joining us later on. Um, and with that, I would like to pass it over to our moderator Lucy. Thank you Claire, good morning everyone, real pleasure to be here and Lorraine so lovely to see you again after about six years apart and excited to have a conversation with you this morning. So our conversation this morning is going to be around Africa's tech ecosystem and we're going to be thinking about the, why technology is a key driver of growth and opportunity in Africa, um, where Africa can leverage a competitive advantage to grow uh, something I'm really interested in, and I read this uh, amazing stat um, in advance of this panel that I didn't realise that, you know, over 60% of Africa's population are under 25. So how can young people play a key role in the global IT ecosystem and what is needed to support them? And then the thing probably very close to my heart, which I'll maybe talk a little bit about later, is how we can close the gap for financial inclusion and empower in particular women and young people in Africa um, to become more financially included and empowered. So that's the goal of our time together this morning. We've got through till around 11.30 together. So Lorraine, I'm gonna kick off over to you to say a little bit more about this amazing role you have in Grow For Me. And you know, what are you excited about in the tech ecosystem in Africa? Yeah, thank you. Firstly, thank you very much for having me. It's exciting for me to be back here. Um, I, I graduated from my Ember program at Oxford in 2018, so it's really exciting to be back um, amongst people that I'm 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 familiar with. So, Lucy, great to see you as well. Um, so, growth for me. I actually um, came on board the growth for me team a couple of years ago. In fact, again, another Oxford connection that led to me working. Uh, with Growth For Me, so a startup based in Ghana. Um, they're really about looking at how we close the gap when it comes to food affordability um, and also looking at how we reduce the gap when it comes to uh, food security. So for us, we're all about, you know, we're, we're pan-African. Uh, we're looking at how we can make sure we get more youth involved in the agriculture space. I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have, particularly around this space. Um, and my experience has, has, has helped me to hopefully give you some of the, um, the, the, the answers that you're looking for in today's conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, let, let's kick off with a big picture question. You know, what hurdles are there in the continent to overcome and harness the power of technology? I think that's quite a good place to kick off and then we'll drill down. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think those of us that are African and I classify myself as African, I'm British born um, and I am of Ghanaian descent. But those of us that often are frequently traveling over to Africa will see some of these issues and these hurdles, you know, very, it's very, very obvious. And one of those that we see is the fact there is high literacy rates. Now across, Ghana, across Africa, and according to the World Bank, the rate is currently around 65%. Now we wanna make sure we can look at increasing that. And I think there are some of the systemic issues that exist that are causing some of those rates. And I think one of those is that there is um, a, a really, and I, and, and I, I hope I'm not going to be offending anyone because I'm going to be going very direct based on my experience. A lot of our education on the continent is very theoretical. You know, and because of that, we're stifling some innovation. A lot of the education is based on theory. So you go to school, you're learning because this is what you see. This is what the lecturers told you. This is what the teachers told you. And you're going to regurgitate that and get your grades, right? So a lot of that 
is stifling the innovation that that could allow for some of the African youth to start to harness the power of technology. And that leads me on to say, as well, there is a lack of vocational training. Right. And a lot of our education system is fundamentally based on people learning to get jobs rather than learning and training people to be able to maybe start their own businesses. And we need students to become more forward thinkers, problem solvers and idea generators. And that really calls upon the use of technology as a tool. Right. So until we can break the barriers and the hurdles when it comes to um, allowing people to have voc vocational education and practical based education as well that will allow us to kind of harness the power of technology and then lastly i also think that there is a lot of um narratives that need to be shifted so when it comes to media the media is a very powerful source when it comes to shaping and driving narratives right you know today our, our, our media is very much focused on um political um the political agenda and maybe other larger topics such as that but how do we start to shine a light on some of the new technologies that are coming up and changing that narrative and the mental barriers that exist by endorsing and, 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 and patronizing some of those new innovative products and quality products that our African youths have actually put out there? Amazing. I mean, two huge levers, right? Media and education that you, you've you've spoken about really passionately there. Love to know and just encourage everyone listening to kind of pop comments in, put questions in um, for us and, and share your experience a, a, across the continent, because I know you're from all over Africa, listening in and, and beyond. Certainly hearing you say that, Lorraine, you know, it, it resonates with me being educated in the UK and something I feel really passionately about is that people just don't get that practical education. I see it every day in my work at Stepladder. People don't know about interest rates. They don't know basic things about mortgages um, because we're just taught theory at school. So I think I think it, it totally resonates with, with me having been educated in the UK and seeing what goes on here. So just diving into that piece a bit more to pick up on financial inclusion. I mean, what do you, do you feel, do you have any views on kind of what's being done on financial education uh, in Africa? I think there's a few different things, but um, I, I think we could certainly do more. Um, I think the 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 fact that now there is more. I remember when I was writing the paper when I was doing my Ember and talking about the fact that in across Africa, there are seventy percent of Africans are unbanked. Right. So we're looking at how do we close that gap when it comes to financial inclusion? And I think right now, the, the fact that you've got access and one of the leading com countries was Kenya with M-Pesa and getting things like, you know, mobile based um, banking opportunities through to the unbanked, I think was a, a, you know, a great starter. And other African countries have followed Ghana in particular, doing mobile money in other countries like that. And I think it's it, by having... Uh, more challenger banks and more different financial um, instruments that are making it more accessible to those people that are unbanked is naturally allowing people to become more inquisitive about opportunities in the financial space and learning about what happens, right? How do we make sure that people can be, you know, do, do you know, get access to credit, why? Because some people are now starting to use their, their the, the way that they're starting to use um, their mobile wallets, for example, um, are starting to use that as a means of checking their credit worthiness. So I think the more and more people are starting to use these more, quote unquote, informal or less traditional ways of banking, they're now starting to understand, you know, the, the opportunities that exist and then allowing themselves to actually become included in the financial sector. So once we start to, to, to harness those top type of opportunities, naturally you're going to start to see some of those things follow. I hope that answers your question. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so interesting to hear you say that. And I, you know, I've read those similar stats about the unbanked and, and all of all of these startups that are coming through links me back to what you said about the media. And I'm interested to know in, in your view, like how have the success of companies like M-Pesa and these other digital challenger banks, how, how has that been covered uh, in the media? Does it inspire the young people of Africa to do the same thing? Or is it kind of pushed aside because of maybe the other media coverage? I think it's inspired, right? I, I think um, I might be a little bit controversial here, but th there is a deeply rooted challenge that also exists. A lot of people on the continent, the media is there, right? It's very prevalent. 
But in the way that some people consume media, you know, especially with the youth, they are likely to consume media through their smartphones. But then herein lies a challenge. A lot of people don't even have access to the internet to be able to even now consume that media, right? In, in especially those those success stories about what are some of the things that are happening, right? Because they're probably going to be stifled with disproportionate information around, you know, politics and other things like that. But how do we get, you know, these success stories to those people that are going to be the future tech entrepreneurs that are going to start developing? these new applications, right, that we need in the system. And one of the challenges we have on the continent as well is around the price of data, right? And for people that, that, that I remember there was a stat um, that was that, you know, there are 78% of, of sub-Saharan Africans that have access to mobile phones, but only 20% have access to be able to access the internet, right? And we're talking about the media. So a lot of people today access their media and their news stories through their smartphone. But if only 20% of individuals can access that media, there is an issue, right? So what do we need to do? Or what, what, what then is fundamentally or systemically wrong? And I start to think about it. I think, well, there is a lack of access. The, the price of data itself, internet data across the Africa, across African continent is disproportionately expensive in comparison to their earnings, right? I was doing some research and I was looking into a map of um, the prices of data across Europe and across Africa. Now, they're actually on par but then the earning potential is not on par. So there's something disproportionate there, right? So it's there is something that that needs to be resolved first. And then we can then look at, okay, well, we've also got the media, which is a separate, that needs to be tackled as well. But then when those two things could marry each other, then those youth and those people that have could start to access the media, you know, they're then able to then see these positive stories. They're inspired and they're able to, you know, get out there and do similar things. Exactly. And it becomes one of those wonderful virtuous cycles, doesn't it, where you see it and, and, and then things can start happening. It's so interesting what you say about the data. And I think, you know, we'd be remiss to talk on a panel on technology. We read a lot about how technology is accelerating across the continent, but it would be remiss not to exactly talk about this point of the access uh, to to broadband. I read um, just yesterday something from the World Bank about that when households um, and when an area gets broadband coverage, the level of poverty um, in households moves up by 7%. So households move out of that highest right. tier of poverty. Right. 7% right. of households move out once they get the broadband right. um, because I'm of that access. And, you know, that, you know, it, it's, it's just it's just such an important thing. And I think at this point we have to, it's a shame Emma's not here to talk about this, but it'd be great to get your views and then anyone in the audience that wants to comment and we can ask Emma if she joins us because I think, you know, we have to talk about what role do the government play in this? Entrepreneurs um, and education do certain amounts of things, but what is the government's role um, in this access to technology? I, I really, really love what you mentioned. And I was thinking about this before and I thought to myself, right? And, and, and you looked, you said exactly like those, individuals that now have access to broadband are now able to move out of that top level of poverty. And I, 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 I find that really interesting because, you know, um, those of us that know about the Maslow's theories of needs, you will know that food and water is at the base of that pyramid, right? Those are the things that are considered to be the necessities in life and what you need. But now some theorists have now said Wi-Fi and internet access are also on par with food, water and shelter. Right. And I actually do believe that. So once you actually have access to the basic necessities in life, it then takes you out of that needs, that that base of the pyramid, so to speak. Right. So I think there's a lot of things that the government could do to support to get people. We're focusing on food scarcity. We're fo focusing on, you know, water scarcity and shelter and affordable housing and all of that. But what about the scarcity when it comes to broadband and access to Wi-Fi? Because they are all now at the base of the pyramid, because once they have access to that, it takes them out to that. It takes them out to another level. And I was laughing sorry I do this sometimes I was laughing to myself and I think to myself during the war or during times where they started to give or, or even to still to today they used to give out food vouchers right for people to have access to food why are they not giving out access to internet and data because data is now also at the base of the pyramid right as a necessity in life and I think if the government could facilitate 
schemes like that where the poorest of the poor now have some form of voucher or access or whatever it may be to data so they can consume the media they can then be inspired and they can then go on and educate themselves and learn to do the things we've just discussed in the previous question right so i think that's something that the government could do um but also what are the policies and what are the public private um, partnerships that can also be done right can we offer tax rebates to corporations that might start to um, train individuals on coding or hiring the next generation of tech employees? Um, can we incentivize our, our corporation, even get crowdfunds for new ideas and, um, and generate new innovations, right? Can we do subsidies on government-backed subsidies? Can we, as an, um, and I'm also upset that Emma's not here right now, but what can we do for, for, our nations to improve the ease of doing business in those areas to enable in investment from alternative sources, right, to encourage JVs across the continent. Um, and to, to Lucy, your area, what kind of education can be done? Um, I know in Ghana, for example, our government um, a, a few years ago, they've rolled out free education for primary school ages and above. But what can we do a bit more in terms of the tech space? Can we educate around coding? Um, can we do what, what the UK is doing and corporations like Barclays are doing coding classes for primary school ages? So what kind of private public partnerships can be done uh, around that area? And I think that's some of the things that the government could do. Lorraine, I love I love what you say about Maslow. I mean, as a as a sort of business psychologist and coach, I talk a lot about Maslow and, and positive psychology and that hierarchy of needs. And, you know, initially when this idea came out, there were memes around like, oh, and we need Wi-Fi. And it was kind of a bit of a joke, wasn't it? Going back a few years where you'd say, oh, we need food, water, shelter and Wi-Fi. And they, they were a kind of a joke, but actually it's not a joke anymore. It's absolutely essential. I think you throw in something like the pandemic where then digital access becomes even more crucial uh, for, for survival and, and mental health and everything that goes with that. Um, I think what you say about the, the sort of tokens that were given out in the war, I mean, this is, this is a, a serious thing that needs to be considered. Love to know from anyone listening, if you've got any comments on this, if you've got any experience of this, very aware of the diversity across the continent and what's going on in different countries. I think Lorraine's given such a brilliant um, sort of view there on, on Wi-Fi has to be seen as fundamental. And Lorraine, when you were saying there about education and the coding, and I think, you know, we are doing some good stuff in the UK in terms of teaching young people to code. And certainly I, ha I have two little nieces and I said to my sister, oh, I really want to teach them to speak Spanish because I wish I'd learned Spanish earlier. And then I stopped myself and I thought, hang on a minute, you're a woman in tech. Let's teach them to code. Like, why do you know, Spanish? Great, whatever. But let's teach them to code age three, age five. Let's let's get them doing that. And code so, is a global language now, isn't it? Right. <laughs> exactly. It is. It should be. It should be. It should be the second language everyone learns. Um, especially with the technology we have to translate kind of native languages. So I think that's definitely an interesting way to think about it. I've, I've noted down some questions if Emma does. I mean, I love that she's in a cabinet meeting, you know, live doing doing things right now in the, it, for the Republic of Namibia. So uh, I've noted down a couple of questions that we'd like to ask her in, 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 in that side of kind of governments, which I think is important. But let's dive a bit more into your role as the chief of sales at, uh, at Grow For Me, Lorraine, and how it tell us a bit more about crowdfunding and how it's transformed I mean, in particular, the sector you're working in, the agricultural sector. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Grow For Me, I'm super excited about because it's it's a startup that we've been working on for two years. It's Google backed as well, um, which is super interesting and, and great for us. But we specifically operate in that agritech space, so crowdfunding, crowd farming, commodity trading. So as you mentioned, or as was mentioned in the intro, we basically now for anyone, wherever you are, you could be, you know, sitting at home, you can be in your lecture, you could be, you know, working behind your desk, anyone to be able to invest in agriculture with as little as the equivalent of 25 US dollars. Now we're trying to do that to help grow economies but also to achieve social impact and also create opportunities. Now uh, we do that as a way of bridging the gap between agriculture, the traditional form of agriculture, which has high job prospects, but also the tech space, uh, which of course has taken the world by storm. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is trying to close the gap when it comes to food security. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic, because what we realized through the pandemic was that 
you know, when everyone, especially those in the UK, when Boris Johnson announced lockdown, everyone ran to go and buy toilet roll and food, right? So our shelves at Tesco's and Sainsbury's were running out of food. And that got get, gets you thinking, right? The necessity of food, and we've just spoken about Nas- Maslow's theories of needs, that means it needs to be supported by a certain value chain, right? And that early part of the value chain is the agriculture space. So therefore the agriculture is a necessity and an area that is growing and considered the green gold. In Ghana, for instance, where I'm from, and I do appreciate the diversity of the individuals watching, but in Ghana where our, our, our company is formed, the GDP of Ghana reduced during the pandemic, but agriculture proportionally was growing. So it goes to show that agriculture on the whole is growing. Now, what we at Growth For Me do is all about looking at how do we make agriculture attractive to the youth? And I'm glad we're speaking today fundamentally about the youth. Now, um, I've got a question for you, Lucy. If you were to think about a farmer, right? What sort of age group would you think about a farmer being? I've got I'm sort of primed on that one actually because my dad was a farmer uh here in in the UK so I immediately my immediate thought is somebody in their kind of 60s and that is the answer I get all across the board that is the answer right mm-hmm. 60s 50s etc and what we're finding is that our farmers are aging right but where why Lucy are you not in farming why are you not taking over from your dad Right. And because there is a lack of attraction to the youth to that farming space. Why? Because a lot of people are seeing there's not a lot of investment in that area and doesn't have the earning potential as maybe you, Lucy, working now in in, in tech ed or ed tech. Sorry. So so it's we're now trying to look at ways that we increase the investment into agriculture so that our aging farmers can now hand off to their successors, to their children, who typically will run off to the cities and get office jobs or what have you. And I think Lucy, your prime example here, um, but making it more interesting for those people to start to invest and get into agriculture. So what we do is we enable anyone wherever you are, and typically we focus on the diaspora, to actually invest with as little as 25 US dollars into agriculture so they can sponsor crops that smallholder farmers will grow, such as maize, rice, pineapple, soya bean, and so on and so forth. And for every unit that has been sponsored, we are creating jobs for five people and improving the livelihoods of five people across Ghana in particular. Now we are planning to to roll this out um, across the board. So other than the social impact that we're doing, we're also enabling people to generate financial returns from the comfort of their own living room. So with as little as I said, 25 US dollars, you can generate returns up to you know 30 percent and i'm not here to sell and and must be very clear that you know our and as any investor would would talk about past performance does not equal future uh, returns but it's you know we're also given the opportunity for people to generate returns from the investment space um in agriculture particularly in ghana Amazing. I've got so, I've got so many questions to dive into there. So, you know, where, where to begin? So I, I guess just the sort of first one, you talked about the diaspora being able to invest. Um, and if, from which countries, though, back into, into Africa? Where's everywhere. The, everywhere. So a lot of people, yeah, around the world. So we've got thousands of sponsors. We call them sponsors, not investors, because you're sponsoring um, farmers today that maybe have access to acres and acres of land but they don't have the financial support to actually grow to the full capacity. So you are sponsoring those farmers in a profit sharing model. Um, So you're bringing your investment, the sponsors are, um, the farmers are are growing. And then at the end of it, we would work with the farmers to then trade the commodities to generate a return. And then we'll split. um, So everyone will get a piece of the pie, for instance, right? So consider it, we see this almost like an Uber, but for for agriculture, you don't you get into an Uber car, you don't know who the driver is, right? You you don't you're going to a destination and you don't you're not using your own car, right? So your destination might be social impact and financial returns, but you don't necessarily know the farmer. The farmer's going to grow on your behalf, and you don't have to own the car, you don't have to own the farm, right? So to answer your question more specifically, you could be anyone across the world. Yes, I say the diaspora because there's a lot of uh, drive at the moment to reconnect a lot of diaspora with those with with. The the continent uh, but anybody we have sponsors across the globe dubai uk us um australia uh, europe wherever you are south africa um, and you have the opportunity you don't have to be Ghanaian, you don't have to have any affiliation to ghana and you can grow so just check out our website growforme.com 
Amazing. That's brilliant. Thank you. And then lifting it up a level, you said you're backed by Google. So congratulations on that. It's always great to be backed by a large debt company, right? So interested to know how if you can share anything about what that's been like. And also what else are, what else are companies like Google um, doing? Are they are they working in particular sectors in Africa? Um, is agriculture a focus for them? And what sort of support do they give? Yeah, so um, Google for us, um, at the time, we applied to the 50 Black Tech Founders Program, I think it was called. So for me, it was super interesting that multinational companies and, multi- uh, and large corporations like this are seeing what the, 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 the prospects and potential is on the continent and finding tech entrepreneurs like ourselves and providing them with mentorship and, um, and, and and funding. So we actually managed to secure funding from them as well. Um, so we were one of 50 startups uh, last year that got this back in. Um, so for us, it was it's super, it's super amazing, but they weren't just back in those in agriculture. You know, it's very, very varied. It's FinTechs, it's, it's, it's EdTech, it's every, you know, there was, there was it's every, it's everything, right? So um, what I'm loving right now that's happening on the continent is that that these corporations are seeing the potential. You've got companies like Twitter that are setting up their, their offices in, in Africa, right? You've got large corporations that are seeing the potential and want to tap into these untapped resources um, that can help to close some of these gaps we've been talking about. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And we need more of that, right? We need more t- big tech companies doing this and, and more funding available. Um, when you were saying something there about the kind of the agriculture and allowing people to kind of invest and then creating those jobs, it just uh, made me think of something we're doing at Stepladder. If if you don't mind me sharing just this on on on, on the work at Stepladder, which is I think the reason I was invited um, to to be part of this amazing conference. Um, we do work with ROSCAs, Rotating Savings and Credit Associations, which is the technical term for, I guess, for most people listening, you may know, um, if you're Nigerian heritage, you may know it was an ADJO. In Ghana, I know, Lorraine, it's called a SUSU or an ISUSU. Um, uh, a Chilemba, I think um, it's called in various parts of Uganda. They go over lots of different local names as well. A Stockvale in, in South Africa and a Upato um in other parts of Africa. So I'm just throwing out a few names, you might recognize these. And they're, they're sort of um, community lending circles. So we've put technology, um, we've put a technology platform behind that model and we've introduced it here in the UK to start with. But what we're getting is a lot of interest from um, African larger banks, but also challenger banks across the continent saying, we do this in our communities, but we, we've never done it with technology or or put that kind of regulation around it and so what we're doing is having conversations with various banks across Africa to say you can white label this technology and then use it to kind of grow fuel your own business so one thing that we're doing is um, really we're very aware that we don't want to take an idea from a community and then monetize it ourselves Um, this is an idea that's been used around the world, actually, for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's been used across Asia, South America, it's huge in the Caribbean. Um, but it's this idea of we've got this tech platform. We're helping people in, in the UK. We're helping people buy their first homes. That's the big challenge here. But, for example, in Nigeria, we're talking about kind of how to buy cars and how to pay for healthcare using it. Um, in Egypt, how could this fund um kind of small medium enterprise businesses will be used for remittance and so I just love that idea and I think you're like that sort of stage further ahead of course Lorraine by already being in 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 Africa um, with your business but I love this idea that we could kind of white label that technology we have at Stepladder to run a Roska or an Adjo, a Chilemba and a Susu and then that just creates a whole uh, series of jobs and access to to the technology and that financial inclusion piece so this is a little bit about kind of my background and and why I have such a passion for financial inclusion and I think it's really important with all of these things I'd be interested to know in your situation Lorraine if this is the same in agriculture but for 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 fintech what we're finding is it's very very important to talk um, differently 
in each country about the use cases and how it's going to work, which is why we wouldn't ever go and say, hey, we're stepladder in Ghana, we're stepladder in Nigeria. We want to do with a local partner and allow um, that ecosystem to grow within country with the right kind of cultural influence. And it would just be a kind of powered, powered by the stepladder technology. I think that seems to me very important for somebody that doesn't actually, you know, have any experience of operating in Africa. Very diverse, you know, Africa is so super diverse. You know, and so I'm glad that you mentioned the various variations or susu and and and, and so on. So it's it's tremendously diverse. So you're it's absolutely the right approach that we need to localize um, our, our our processes um, according to the various cultures and processes that exist um, in the various countries. So yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got a, a question slash comment coming in from Patrick Cox. So thank you, Patrick. It says, could WAP Internet SMS newsletters be used to share information, knowledge and lessons for the 80 percent that don't have access to mobile Internet? Sorry, so repeat the first part of the questions. Could WAP Internet, WAP, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't know that acronym, but hopefully you do. Uh, or SMS newsletters be used to share information, knowledge and lessons for the 80 percent that don't have access to mobile Internet. Absolutely. So one and I'm going to take the agriculture example here. So in Ghana um, and apologies for those the terminology, but we call um, the phones that um, don't have access, you know, for SMS, you know, just call it an SMS. We call them yam phones. Right. And a lot of our farmers tend to have that they don't have smartphones so there's a company and and quite often on on the oxford platform um you tend to see this company called farmer line um they are completely amazing they actually focus on getting out news to these farmers that don't have access to smartphones using ussd and and wap etc cetera, etc cetera. so that is a fundamental an opportunity is absolutely a great way sms um to to get them access to that but it's also quite costly right so um sending sms and things like that so we do need to look at how they can get access to more richer data um you know because that's going to be quite quite um basic data that they're going to get when we send out sms and newsletters through those mechanisms but it is fundamental so i, I wouldn't disregard that space at all in fact the majority of people have access at least to that form um and 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 absolutely is an area that we should we should um push out information and use towards Brilliant. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you, Patrick, for, for that question. I'm going to start to bring it to a close now. But I think just to finish, Lorraine, love to ask you, you know, if we were to meet again, you know, one year from now and have a similar conversation about technology in Africa, what are your kind of hopes of what might have, have moved on in that year and where we might be? absolutely have to talk about agritech space because agriculture for us is is uh, is amazing so i do see that there's going to be more agritech um in in uh, blossoming and coming up um i do hope for the future that our data proportionally the prices will reduce somehow um i i'm having hope for the future i'm not sure if it's going to be in a year's time when we meet again lucy but i do have hope um that that something can be done or the government can subsidize for the poorest of the poor you know access to data so we can increase the levels of people from 20 percent, 35 percent that have access to smartphones far, further up you know you will get it to 40 50 percent at the very least Right. I'm loving the work that's going on across the continent in terms of um, hubs and innovation hubs. You've seen a lot of these come up um, that are enabling environments across South Africa and Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, etc. You know, you've got impact hub that's entered into different countries across um, the African continent as well. So I'm really seeing a lot of these centers that have opened up, which are going to help to foster innovation. So I'm just looking forward to seeing the innovation that's coming up, lower data prices, agritech coming up, uh, women in tech, more women in tech, and really looking at how the government supports education um, in, in the tech space as well. So I'm hoping for um, more in that area. Lorraine, amazing. Thank you. I think there, there, there's so many things to be excited about, but this, it seems to me, 
um, as somebody who's quite new to kind of diving into this whole area of, of tech and Africa, that this fun, this fundamental moving Wi-Fi down to the bottom of Mas Maslow's hierarchy and saying, you know, we need food, water, shelter, but without Wi-Fi, none of these great things, or, you know, it will always be the investment from Google or the, the access to the information or the inspirational stories will be limited to the few. So until we move that to that bottom of that Maslow uh, hierarchy, um, that seems crucial. So I think on that note, I'd just like to thank you so much. It's been amazing to talk to you. Wonderful to hear about the work you're doing in the agri sector and also just beyond that as a very inspiring woman in technology. Thank you for, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.